Oh yeah, just right. All right, we'll leave the pans off. If it gets really warm, we'll just turn on one of them on low or something like that. But uh, if you start seeing a bunch of people fan themselves, then, then we'll know it's a little warm. We want to keep you uh, uh, keep you comfortable uh, uh, physically. We want to afflict you spiritually. Amen. And uh, at least the Holy Spirit will. And we trust the Holy Spirit will speak your heart this morning. You know what? We had a wonderful time at the couples retreat. Uh, by the way, couples, if you didn't go this last uh, this, uh, this last weekend here, uh, Friday and Saturday, I would encourage you to make plans to go next year. Uh, we had a, a couple, uh, for instance. Uh, uh, they've been married for 20 years, and uh, um, she, uh, uh, for their anniversary gift, she said uh, to her husband, I'd like to go to this couple's retreat. Uh, this gentleman was not saved, um, and uh, he was there. Uh, he enjoyed it, and I said, do you think he'd come back next year? He goes, I would seriously consider it. And uh, so uh, um, you never know what God will use Amen. to speak to hearts. Uh, but I would encourage you next year to make plans to uh, be here. Uh, of course, you'll miss out on the speaker that we have. We had a wonderful time uh, with our, our speakers, uh, uh, Pastor Copes and his wife Pam. Uh, they did a, a wonderful job, and uh, uh, he did an excellent job this morning during the Sunday school hour. If you missed the Sunday school hour, I would encourage you. It's not just for the kids, amen. It's for you adults as well, and uh, Kyle would be a part of it. And uh, I know a lot of times people think of Sunday school as well. It's for the kids. It's not. It's to help you to grow yeah, and mature, and uh, uh, we want to see that happen in your life. But um, I've asked uh, Pastor Coates to uh, come and preach this morning, uh, so I hope you've given me your undivided attention as it brings the word of life to you this morning. Well, it's good to be in the Lord's house. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I'm uh, just going to make very quick reference. We've got the a table back there, some literature about Heartland, some CDs. And uh, some books, got a book back there, Case for Bible College, if you know a young person that's trying to decide or parents trying to decide whether their child should go to Bible College, that's an excellent book to look at to get. And then the CDs there are music we don't, we have a real desire to put good Christian music into the homes. Amen. And uh, if you have that desire and if you can uh, pay $10 for the CD, well that's the price. And if you can't um, pay that money, come by and see me. And... Um, now, if you come dressed like this, yeah. <laughs> and you got like a Michael Kors purse or something like that, you know, <laughs> I'm probably not going to let you take the CD. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you don't have that $10 and you want to get some good music to replace some uh, stuff, I'm very happy to give you those, those CDs. Amen. And so be ready to do that. But don't come up and, you know, try to snow me on that one, okay? <laughs> huh? Am I not on? Huh? How's that one? No? We on? Okay. Mom? Good? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Everybody that wants to hear me, can you hear me? <laughs> okay, we're good? Oh, that sounds better. Yeah. Oh, we don't need to repeat that announcement. Yeah. Yeah. And I will apologize in advance if anybody is looking for that CD where I was the solo. Yeah. Uh, we're out of those right now. Uh, we're, actually, we always seem to be out of those. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Looking forward to tonight's message. I pray that you come back. The title of the message is just Conflict. I got your attention now, don't I? Yeah. Conflict resolution. Amen. You might say, well, you're talking about like country to country? <laughs> no. <laughs> within the family. Yeah. Within your family and within the church family. That's good. Conflict resolution. That's good for you. And it's biblical. The Bible gives us a very clear plan on how to avoid or resolve conflicts. And we'll be looking at, at that tonight. Good friends of ours, all the way from Southwest Baptist Church in Oklahoma City, Tom and Elaine Lanou. Tom grew up just down the road here, and uh, they yeah. bought a place to vacation on the lake there. And so Amen. they're going to be visiting your church a little bit. And, uh, Amen. We love Tom, and we put up with Elaine yeah. at the church. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then once you get to know her, you'll know exactly what yeah. I mean. <laughs> I'm teasing you. You'll love this couple. Amen. And, uh, and so I hope you'll make them feel welcome. Amen. And I think you already have. So, so glad. We're just thrilled to be here. I don't want to take any more time to talk to you more about, about the uh, couples retreat tonight and such like that. And about Heartland. Tonight. Want to really just get down to preaching this week, this morning, 
Uh, here's the title of the message. The battle over the control of your life. The battle <coughs> over the control of your life. You might say, ah, there's not a battle there. Let's look at that. Let's look at that. John chapter 18. John chapter 18. We'll read just a few verses. If you don't mind, we'll stand. And if you can't stand, that will be fine. I'll not make mention of that. Then we'll have a quick word of prayer. And then we'll be seated. It's 1143. I'm going to go really fast. And uh, and if I don't think you're coming along with me, you know, as I go from point to point, my personality is I'll stop and go back. And I'll try to get you. I mean, honestly. So if you're coming with me as I progress through the... The points. Um, let me know that with a good amen. 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 Now, if you just start just rapid firing the amens, just get me done quick. That's wicked. That's just wicked. If you're just going to try to trick me and get it done fast. Uh, but I am a good personality. I'll just, man, I'll, I'll come back there where you're at and I'll say, Are you with me? Yeah, amen. And, uh, you think, No, you wouldn't. Yes, I would. All right? So stay with me. And uh, if you fall asleep while I'm preaching, I will get louder. I and then if you look like you're not liking my preaching, I'll get louder. And I, you know, you, I don't want to get anybody mad at me, but hey, I'm leaving tomorrow, so I live a long ways from here. I'm teasing. None of that. All of that's just fun. Some of it. John chapter 18, verse 1. Verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples. Now just let these words paint this picture in your mind. He went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. So there's Jesus now going over this brook. He's with his disciples, goes into the garden. We know that from another parallel passage, that's actually the garden of Gethsemane. And Judas also, verse 2, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas said, having received a band, think of this, at least 500 or more. When you think of the word band, think of at least 500 or more. Here we go, back to the scripture, of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns, torches, and weapons. We should ask, why would they have Weapons. Why would they have torches? Why would they have lanterns? Why would 500 plus guys have that just to face the small band of disciples? Verse 4, Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come upon him. Aren't you glad Jesus knows all things? Yeah. Yeah. And just think about what's fixing to happen to him. Soon he's going to be hanging on the cross and he knew that at this scene. Yeah. Just let that sink in. And then, as he knows all things that should come upon him, he went forth, means he steps out, and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Soon then, as he had said unto them, I am he, look at this, they went backward and fell to the ground. Amen. Imagine that, 500 plus guys falling over. Amen. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of, them which thou gavest me have I lost none. Then after all of that, that scene, Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear, the servant's name was Malchus, then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath, the cup which my father hath given me. Shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Heavenly Father, this would be a time that I would ask, even on a regular basis, ask for your help. Lord, I'm not going to ask for your help this morning. That would seem to have a pretense that I'd like to have something to do with the rest of the morning. <laughs> Dear God, I'd like to have nothing to do with it. Would you do this morning what only you can do in the lives of your people so that you may be the only one that would get the glory for it? We ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. We go really fast. And if you can just picture now, Jesus has just had here in the, the city... The last supper with the disciples. And so it's his last intimate time.
to share with his disciples some of the most important things that, that he could share with them. And he knows what's going to happen to him as he just progresses through this scene. He knows that his life will be taken. He'll, he'll, he'll hang on the cross and, and sacrificially give his own life for us. He knows all that. And he's just had the last supper, that time with the disciples. And now he's come down out of the city. And we see in verse 1 that he comes down and he's in the Kidron Valley. And as he's walking down with his disciples, and it's not an unknown path to him because we see that he's been here before. It says right there in Scripture that he's been there oft times. So there's this very familiar way with him walking now through the Kidron Valley. And he comes upon the Kidron Brook at this time. So can you just imagine as he's walking, and he knows as he's walking through the Kidron Valley, he sees the Kidron Brook. And oh, and by the way, we shouldn't go too fast here for a moment. We should recognize that during this week of the Passover, where there would be a lot of sacrifices, the locals had a nickname for the Kidron Brook. They would call it at this time of the year, the Bloody Brook. The reason they would call it the Bloody Brook is that in the city, there would be a lot of animal sacrifices in one week, like thousands of animal sacrifices when you have thousands of animal sacrifices in one city uh, it's pretty gory but there was a lot of what bloodshed so every time that there would be an animal sacrifice you'd have it on the altar and you'd have to clean the altar down and you would have then bloody water and and, and having all of that within this city and all of the influx of people that have come into this city for this one time to to be a part of this this fast if you would this passover can you imagine every time you washed down the altar you would have bloody water and i can only imagine that they would have had some type of gutter system some type of trough system so that when you would wash all that waste or bloody water off it would flow down into a gutter that would maybe sidewalk or to connect into an alleyway so that this city must have had some form of a primitive wastewater drainage system. You just wouldn't let the wastewater from life just sit there. Are you with me? So they must have some type of primitive system. What it was like, I'm not sure. But all of it would come together and all of it would, the way they would have it developed, and it would all come together and empty into the local water treatment plant managed by the EPA. Yeah. <laughs> no, there was no EPA back then. Hallelujah, that might have been a good day. Anyways, it did empty into the local water treatment, if you would, river. It yeah. emptied into the Kidron Brook, yeah. the local water system. That's why they nicknamed it the Bloody Brook. Jesus, knowing all things that should come upon him, Jesus, who is all God and all man, Ask me to explain that. I really can't, but I know it's true because it's in the Bible. That's right. He was all God and all man. He sees this blood flowing through the brook. I, I, I don't know what, what exactly he thought, but that man that I would think that I would have seen, that blood, I would say, my blood is soon going to be required if I continue to go down this path, and I would do this. I'm going to say, I'm turning around and going back. Yeah. But Jesus walks over the key drawn brook. In a sense, it's in my mind, he's illustrating the blood that I'm going to be shedding over here very soon is going to replace all of the blood right there as animal sacrifice. Amen. Aren't you glad you don't have to do animal sacrifices Amen. for the forgiveness of your sins? Some of you would have to have a pretty big flock. Yeah. <laughs> I would. That's for sure. Jesus' blood replaces all of that. Amen. Once it's applied to someone's account, it's forever. Praise the right. Lord for it. So Jesus now walks up to the other side of the valley, and he's now in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know that from another parallel passage. And we know this is the garden where he actually invited the disciples to join him in prayer. And they end up what? Falling asleep. Yeah. He ends up having a time of prayer by himself. It's so stressful knowing all that should come upon him. He actually starts to sweat drops of blood. We know that from another parallel passage. And then now he's up from his time of prayer. We know from our passage that we read this morning that he actually sees the band. That means it was 500 or more with weapons and torches and lanterns coming up that same path out of the city where, where he just was a whole week. And they didn't even lay a hand on him. They didn't touch him. They didn't bother him. But now they're coming up to get him. And he knows it. And instead of concealing himself in this high position on the Garden of Gethsemane, Scripture says he went forth. That means he stepped out. He, he, and he's the one that engages them in the conversation. He's, in a sense, he's, he's controlling even the dialogue between him and the soldiers. He yeah. steps up and says, whom seek ye? And, and he's 
And they literally just shout back at Jesus of Nazareth. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine 500 soldiers and, and Judas is with them and, and they say Jesus of Nazareth. And, and he just says, I am. And they all, it's just very simple. They fell backwards to the ground. Can I put it this way? They were utterly helpless. Yeah. They could do nothing. He didn't reach into a leather pouch and throw a bunch of pixie dust on them. <laughs> no. He didn't take a hanky and wave. He didn't spit on them. <laughs> he didn't say a bunch of words that no one could interpret. He just said, I am. He used out, called out one of his Old Testament names, and they went backwards. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ when That's it's right. called out. It's Amen. just that way. It's an amazing thought. And, 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 and I can imagine... In my mind, this is just in between the lines of the scripture, but I can imagine these 500 or more men, soldiers, and officers with weapons and torches and lanterns, and they brought those weapons and torches and lanterns because they thought Jesus would run. <coughs> they thought he would hide. They, they thought they might have to burn him out. They thought that his disciples would fight them back. That's why they brought their weapons and torches and lanterns. And Jesus, I, I can only imagine this as they started to maybe get back up off their, their backside. <laughs> They started to brush off their backside, pick up their weapons, and probably looked at each other and said, What happened? Did you get did you get knocked over? Yeah, all, all of us just got knocked over. Man, what was going on? I mean, Captain, what what just happened? And, and then Jesus asked them again, Whom seek ye? Now, in my mind, this is what the soldiers must have said. Don't anybody answer that guy. <laughs> Nobody get into a conversation. Because whatever just happened to us, that guy had something to do with it. Yeah. Don't even. Don't even respond. Mm. There's a battle here over control, and I think you can see it. Isn't it obvious that Jesus right now in this scene is in control of this situation? Yeah, he just yeah. knocked over 500 soldiers. Knocked them over just by saying one of his names. That's what you just heard. That's what you just read. We tried to illustrate that with these words. But can you imagine this? Peter was there. He was in, well, he was an eyewitness. He saw this. With his own eyes. He was shoulder to shoulder with the Lord himself. And he pulls out a sword. Now I want to illustrate this. And so Brother McCoy has now been my voluntold. <laughs> <laughs> Not volunteer, but voluntold. Now I don't have a sword. We're going to illustrate Peter cutting off Malchus's ear. And since I'm the guest preacher, I get to pick who plays who. That's right. <laughs> I'm going to be Peter. <laughs> And you're going to be Malchus, all right? So the only qualification, your IQ doesn't have to be really that high. I just have to make sure you know the difference between your right and your left. So you're right here. There you go. That's it. So listen, Peter wasn't going for Malchus's ear. I mean, honestly, pulling out a sword and you're picking out one of the 500 guys with weapons, pulling out a sword and trying to cut off his ear, well, that's about as crazy as... Well, boxing somebody and biting his ear. Right? <laughs> That's about how crazy that is. Remember when that happened? Amen. That's right. So there's no way he was going after his ear. He was going after his head. Malchus must have leaned over, and then he got his ear. And so what I'm going to do, and I'm kind of nervous right now. My medicine will kick in in a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. We'll go slow motion a couple times as we illustrate this, and then we'll pick it up the last time. So thank you. For that. You might need the, the hanky, so when I strike your ear off, to, so we don't get blood. These, this carpet's just been clean. You just put the hanky to your ear, and then I need, I'm sure Malchus screamed. We don't need a girly scream, but we need a manly scream. <laughs> a big, loud, manly scream. And then, in another parallel passage, Jesus picks up the ear and actually puts it back on Malchus and heals him. So as soon as I cut your ear off, I'll pick it up and put it back on. It's just what happened. That's right. So, Jesus just knocks over 500 soldiers. I mean, just picture this. It really happened. Mm -hmm. That's right. They just fell backwards to the ground. He just spoke one of his names. Peter is shoulder to shoulder with the Lord himself, and he sees that. And it's almost like in my mind, and, and I'm, I'm thinking this way, that Peter must have said, Lord, I know you just did that, but let me have this one. Let me take care of this yeah. Let me have some control too, Lord. Let me battle this enemy. And it's almost like in a figurative way, pushes the Lord to the side and pulls out his sword, comes at Malchus. Malchus, ow! 
situation on your own, Peter? Are you sure? There, Peter. Then he heals Malthus's ear. So again, repetition's a great teacher. Peter, he has seen the Lord just knock over 500 guys. But let's slow down. This isn't the only time Peter has seen Jesus do some incredible things. Yeah, that's right. He's been walking with the Lord for three years. Amen. He's been seeing the Lord do miracle after miracle. He's seen it in people who couldn't walk who can now walk. He's seen this. He has seen Jesus now perform some incredible miracles. That's right. He has seen this. He has seen Jesus do some incredible things in his own life. That's good. But he decides to. He's forgotten it. Yeah. Or he's decided, I'd like to have control. Yeah. Here. I think every man in here understands that. Yeah. We like to have control. You know? Good. And again, Peter pushes Malchus to the side, wax off, pushes Jesus to the side, and wax off Malchus's ear. Yeah, you know, Peter, I got written in my Bible, the knucklehead, you know. <laughs> That's Peter. Peter, we can't do anything about. So let's talk about, oh, let's talk about me. Because I, I, I pulled up my sword before. Mm. I've approached the enemy. I mean, with a silly plastic knife, <laughs> trying to battle the devil. Yeah, that's a good preacher. In life, that's good. Life's problems. <clears throat> I mean, me, uh, me, even trying to do anything to Brother McCoy, the size of a man he is, with a silly plastic knife—that's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, that's what it's like when I push Jesus to the side. And I say, I know you can do this. You've done it before. I've seen it before. But let me have some control. And I start hacking and whacking, Brother McCoy, hacking my way and hacking my way through life and life's problems. And I end up I end up coming really I end up really hurting the people I'm closest to. That's right. Her name's Pam. Mm -hmm. She's my wife. That's good. Next it would be my daughter. Next it would be fellow church members. Amen. Mom. Up and down the aisles of churches, we can injure each other. That's right. Hacking and whacking. Why? Because we want control That's of good our life. Preacher. And we try to battle things on our own. And the Lord says, put up your sword. The battle is over that we are battling ourselves. That's right. We like to have control of our lives. Yeah. We like to be the ones that steer everything, that point our life this way. We like to be the ones that we think we can battle this. Think of what you have to go through in the next six months of your life. Don't think long term, just think short term, six months. Do you want to do it this way, on your own? Or do you want to surrender? And put up your sword and let Jesus take care of Amen. the enemy. Amen. Think of the decisions you have to make in just the next six months. Do you want to do that on your own? Come on. Parents, do you want to continue to raise your children your way? Young people, you want to make decisions and you know. Some of them that you're going to make soon will be life changing. Yeah. Yeah. You can make some changes in the next six months that will change the rest of your life. One way or the other, you'll go. You want to do that on 
your own grandparents, you want to try to be an influence upon that generation within your own family, and you do it? It's good. You want to try to fix your marriage on your own? You want to try to break your addiction on your own? You want to try to fix your marriage on your own? It's good, preacher. Or do you want to give up and surrender control over to your life? To the Lord. Do you want to stop battling this life and all the problems that come your way? Can I be really, really confrontational? How's it working? That's yeah. right. That's good, preacher. How's it working? If it ain't working, do something different. Because if you keep doing the same thing, you'll have the same results. That's right. It's simple. That's good. You want to have the next six months be different than the last six months? <coughs> do something different. And if you're trying to battle and have control of your life where the Lord Jesus Christ should be the one that controls your life, then stop it and change it and put up your sword. Yeah. And this morning, 12.04, we got a few minutes. Just the family, other than the Copes is in the Lanus, I think it's all church family. Why don't you this morning just say this, I'm giving up. I'm not giving up like you're falling down. I'm giving up the control of my life Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You've seen Good him God. work things in your life before. That's right. But we, like Peter, seem to forget sometimes how powerful he really is. Amen. Would you this morning, during this invitation time, if you're a born-again believer, and if you're hacking and whacking your way through your life by trying to have control, you're going to hurt somebody. And you usually hurt the person that's closest to you. That's right. Mm -hmm. that's good. And I would say this. Stop it. Put up your sword and give control of your life over to the one that died for you. Amen. That gave everything he could for you. He is very, very capable of doing a better job of controlling our lives than us. Would you stand with your heads bowed, your eyes closed? Please don't even wait. If the Spirit of the Lord has been speaking to you, respond to him as he has been leading you. Heavenly Father, we have been asking you to do something that only you can do so you can get the praise. Lord, I pray for that dear, that dear lady right here today that is struggling with life, with marriage. Pray for that man this morning, dear God, that could be struggling with an addiction. Lord, I pray for those children right now, those young people that have some incredibly life-changing, big decisions to make in the next six months. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that's been trying to have control of their life, that they would surrender that control over to you this morning. I ask in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. If you need to come, come quickly.